Um, so this talk is part of the public program for Design for Cultural Commons, which is the postgraduate courses and the PhD program we run at the London Metropolitan University. Um, and uh, I'm, we had an incredible discussion. Oh, somebody didn't have their mute on. We had an inc incredible discussion last night um, with Economy for Common Good. Um, and we're hoping that we can resume that, that level of discussion and enthusiasm today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Mary Knowles. She's a lawyer, um, a common leasehold uh, lawyer, and I won't talk so much about it. I'll let her. Sorry, Taranj, I think you were just muted there. Okay, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, if you could uh, just mute yourselves. Um, again, the chat box is there. If you'd like to put comments uh, and questions, I'll filter through them at the end. Um, but you can also ask your, your questions by putting your hand up after the talk is done. Okay. I'm going to hand over to Marie and welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, nice to see uh, some of you I know already, so nice to see you. Um, for everyone else, my name is Mary. I'm a solicitor. I've been working in private practice in landlord, tenant and common hold uh, for the best part of 20 years. Um, so what I wanted to do this evening is I'm just going to share my screen. I'll turn my video off just while I'm sharing the screen. Um, I just basically wanted to whistle through uh, what is common hold, why hasn't it been very successful, what the government's about to do um, in order to reinvigorate common hold, um, and then basically just open it up to the floor for questions. I think there's going to be quite a lot of different things. Um, I have come up with some questions of my own um, in terms of what I think um, may be of interest for the purposes of tonight's group. Um, so with no further ado, I think the important starting point um, is to really have a look and just sort of refresh ourselves on the tenure types. So in England and Wales, we have three different types of tenure. You've got freehold, leasehold and common hold. And common hold is a form of freehold, which I'll go into in a bit more detail momentarily. On the right hand side, you'll see there that I've prepared a list um, of the different types of buildings, properties that you can get. And you can get any number of combinations, like you can have a leasehold house, um, you can have common hold houses, you can have common hold uh, flats. And you can often get mixed use buildings with commercial on the ground floor, flats upstairs and live to work. In terms of um, the types of landlord that we classically see in England and Wales at the moment, um, for, for reasons that I'll come on to later on in the session, I think it's really important just to pause and have a look at all the different types of landlord that exist in England today, uh, leasehold being the more mainstream tenure over common hold. Um, and I think this really will feed into our debate and it's likely that I may need to come back to this slide um, just for the purposes of the debate. So in England and Wales, the, the different types of landlords, you can get like the ground rent investor who invests money purely for the purpose of extracting ground rent from leaseholders. You can get pension funds who invest in freeholds because it's a very viable um, way of making money. And, you know, Aviva pensions, for example, they have a lot invested in ground rent reversions. And then there's all these other ones um, that may be less obvious, like the Ministry of Defence, for example. Um, they actually own an astronomic amount of land across the country, um, not just for their, um, uh, their personnel, but also just generally. And then you've got people like the National Trust, the Church, Charity, uh, overseas investors, so on and so forth. Importantly, in this bottom right hand corner, um, it is possible for leaseholders at the moment to buy their freehold 
or to take over management of their building. And they're commonly known as RMCs. So if you hear me refer to RMCs, that's what it is. And in that situation, it is where you don't have a third party landlord um, who is overseeing it, like the ground rent investor, Aviva Pension Fund, so on and so forth. Um, it is run by the residents and it's not too dissimilar to the concept of common hold. So before I move on to common hold in more detail, I just wanted to give you some statistics. And this is hot off the press. Um, you'll see a link here at the bottom to the government website, even though it says that these are the statistics up to 2020, um, these statistics were only published on the 8th of July, so a couple of days ago. Um, and here you will see that leasehold versus common hold, um, you've got 4.6 million leasehold dwellings, which accounts for 19% of the English housing stock. Um, and then it's further subdivided between flats and houses and by owner occupier and owned and rented. And this figure here, the 1.8 million owned and rented uh, against the 4.6 million, again, is something that you may want to have a chat about during the debate, um, because the whole concept of common hold is that you manage where you live. So obviously this concept of having a property that you rent out, um, you may be less invested in managing your building than the 2.6 million who own or occupy. By comparison, um, with Common Hold, which has only been around since 2002, um, there are actually fewer than 300 Common Hold dwellings compared to the 4.6 million leasehold dwellings that you have. And that is basically made up in less than 20 buildings. So you can see that comparatively, um, there's, there's a considerably smaller number of Common Hold units than there are leasehold on the stock, um, the English housing stock at the moment. Um, I should say, by the way, as well, um, I'm a lawyer, um, I'm not very tech savvy, so I apologise in advance for some of my slides. This next slide is by far the worst slide you'll see. Um, so putting together the different forms of tenure and the ratios, you'll see here that the, the freehold market accounts for over 80% of the market. You've then got leasehold accounts for 19% of the market, and then less than 1% uh, makes up the common hold market. So to get common hold going, um, you can see what we're up against in terms of numbers and sort of balancing the level playing field. So what is common hold? Let's going to start by looking at leasehold because I think it's much easier to analyse common hold by reference to leasehold. So if you imagine on the left hand side of the screen here that this is a cross section of a building, um, the grey bit is the actual bricks and the mortar on the outside and the pink bits are inside our individual flats. And in terms of what you get, a lease is nothing more than a rental agreement. And this is a really common misconception. If you buy a leasehold flat, you're not actually buying the bricks and mortar. What you're buying is a long term rental agreement. Um, and what the lease does is it gives you a right to occupy rather than a right to own. So the landlord, the freeholder, gets all the bits in grey. So the bits in between the floor joists, um, the communal staircase, any garden and communal land at the front. And the leaseholder gets the right to use the bit inside um, the individual unit. By comparison, common hold um, is very, very different. So it's the same cross section of building. Um, and you'll see here that the freehold on the outside is owned by what's known as a common hold association. And everybody who owns a unit in the building is a member of the common hold association. So the common hold association can never be um, you know, the Crown Estate, the National Trust, a third party investor, pension fund, the Common Hold Association will always purely belong to those who live in the building. And the other fundamental difference um, is that you'll see that rather than having leasehold units here, like we did on the leasehold model, um, in our example here, you own the freehold. So you own a freehold flat. Um, it's called a common hold because it's in a building um, rather than a freehold, but the actual tenure, as it were, is freehold. Um, and you own the bricks and the mortar and you are responsible for what's inside your flat. So when you put those two together, um, just as a quick analogy, leasehold, the building is owned by the freeholder, who can be any one of those parties that I identified in an earlier slide. In the common hold, it's owned by the common hold association, which is made up of the actual people who own the units. 
the units themselves under the leasehold system it's owned by the leaseholder under the common hold system it's common holder in terms of ownership uh, oh, sorry you get the leasehold flat whereas under the common hold model you get a freehold flat what do you get well under the leasehold model it's nothing more than a rental agreement so it's a right to occupy rather than um, outright ownership and in terms of a resident management company um, e even if under the leasehold system, there's this separate right where you can actually buy the freehold of your building together with your fellow leaseholders, um, but it's still very complicated. You don't own the bricks and mortar. You don't lose your lease. You just become a part owner of the freehold overall. And the key distinction between um, leaseholders who own the freehold under the leasehold system is that not everybody has to participate under the common holder. Uh, under the common hold model, everyone, 100% of the people in that building must belong to the common hold association. So it's a bit more of a level playing field. In the leasehold system, the participating leaseholders may only account for 51, 52% of the people who actually live in the building. So that's a fundamental difference between the two. In terms of governance, um, the left hand side here, we have the lease hold uh, system structure and at the very top you will have a lease and the lease is basically a legally binding contract it's the rental agreement it says you can do this you can do that you can't do this you can't do that and it also sets out obligations such as an obligation to pay the landlord towards the cost of the upkeep of the building now the reason why this is um, a, a pyramid shape is because leases um, are very, very standardised. So um, they're not identical and they can be personalised by the landlord. But if you pick up a lease in a block of 200 flats and you pick up a lease in a block of three flats down in Brighton, the content will broadly be similar. It is very unusual to get heavily personalised leases. And as a result of that, because the leases don't really do much um, other than set out the basic contractual principles, what you've then got is this raft of legislation that oversees a lease. And there's actually 16 different pieces of landlord and tenant legislation. And that legislation basically says um, how the lease covenants should be performed. So, for example, if you have an obligation to pay a service charge, the legislation says that the service charge must be reasonable. Um, and it basically then plugs in a whole load of gaps where the lease doesn't really do the job. And then finally, at the bottom, there are thousands of cases that interpret um, either the wording of the lease or the legislation. So you can see that with the lease structure, um, it's very bottom heavy. It relies on third parties like judges and the government to make the law and to set the case law in order to decide how your lease functions. Common hold is the exact opposite. So with the common hold, you don't have a lease. What you have is a document called a common hold community statement. And it's very similar to articles of association for a company. And the common hold community statement does have mandatory things that it has to contain, like ensuring the building, maintaining the roof and things like that. But more importantly, what it has is at the end of the CCS, you have what's known as local rules. And the local rules are absolutely fundamental to the operation of the building because that tells you what the rules are for a very specific building. Um, and, you know, it's not right that you can have a one size fits all. Um, so under the leasehold model, how you manage and run a building that's 200 units is not going to be the same way you manage and run a building that only has two units. It's totally disproportionate. So the leasehold system has tried to shoehorn this sort of one size fits all model, whereas the, the common hold rules is very different because it gives people flexibility to adapt it to their actual building and their living rules. So local rules, for example, might be, um, you know, that you don't want to have pets or you want pets with consent. They might be things like not to have barbecues in the communal areas of the weekend. Basically, the residents set what those local rules are. And because the community um, CCS and the local rules give so much flexibility to the common hold um, 
unit holders on how to run their building. As a result of that, you've only got one piece of legislation. And just in the interests of fairness, the leasehold system has been around for centuries, whereas common hold has only been around since 2002. Um, and that may account for why there's only one piece of legislation. But having spoken to many of the 16 um, buildings that already have common hold, um, you know, legislation wise, I think you know there's less of a need for it. There's less of a need to have judicial input because it's giving so much autonomy at source um, to those who actually belong to the common hold. So in terms of governance, you can see there that it's completely flipped around when you compare leasehold and common hold. So finally, before I move on um, to the next section, how do you get common hold? Um, there are only two ways that you can currently get common hold. The first way is if you live in an existing leasehold building, you can convert to common hold. And that process is fraught with difficulties because you first have to buy the freehold from your landlord. And then once you've got the freehold, 100% of the people in your building, together with any mortgage lenders, must then give 100% consent in order to convert and if you convert your leases in essence get cancelled we come back to this slide and you'll all of this on the left hand side basically gets cancelled and replaced with things like the CCS and the local rules and conversion as far as I know none of the existing uh, common holds unless um, um, I may be misinformed but my impression is that none of the existing common holds have been done as a result of the conversion model. Um, it's fundamentally flawed as a process. The second way is by development. So this is a straightforward case where you've got a developer um, who decides, right, I'm going to develop it in the interest of selling it on as common hold. The development finishes and then the developer hands over the keys, as it were, to the common hold association and it then just lets them um, take it over from there. And that's basically the only two ways at the moment that you can get your common hold. And I think the difficulties with converting, coupled with the lack of incentive to develop, is one of the fundamental reasons why common hold is not taken off in England and Wales at the moment. So why hasn't it worked? Well, I think you could speak to maybe 20 different lawyers and we would all tell you different things. Um, what you'll see on this slide is just um, an overview of sort of the key things that keep coming up over and over. So the first one is consumer demand. Um, you know, leasehold is a concept that has been around for years and years. Um, there are many leaseholders who are still unaware of what common hold is. This links into education and awareness. Um, and linked with that, there's also a lot of people in the industry who don't know what common hold is either. You know, if I want to get a common hold mortgage because I'm thinking about common, buying a common hold unit and I go to the high street in my local village and say, can I have a common hold mortgage? I can guarantee my bank manager will look me with a blank face and say, what are you talking about? Same if I go into the estate agent and say, I've got a common hold unit to sell. I've got no doubt that I will be met with a blank face. And I think this is part of the problem um, is that the availability of products and the education and awareness um, are fundamental in, um, in basically why common hold hasn't worked. Um, I'm a firm believer that if you educate and make people aware, the consumer demand will automatically follow. So I don't think it's the case that, you know, it, I, there's been no surveys done as far as I know, but if there was a straw poll of leaseholders, and we sat them down and said, this is what common hold is. Would you want it as a tenure? And you properly educate them. There's a good chance that you'd get a, a positive response. Whereas if you don't educate them and they don't know what common hold is, it's very difficult to get that consumer interest. In addition to that, you've got competing tenures here at the bottom. Um, and one of the reasons why we've had such extensive reforms in the last three years um, is because about 10, 15 years ago, there was a very small number of developers who decided that actually the leasehold system was a brilliant way to make ridiculously large amounts of money. Um, one of the ways is via ground rents. So what they started doing is they were selling off properties um, with extraordinarily high ground rents. Um, and as a result of that, the, the leaseholders who bought these properties ended up with unsaleable and unmortgageable properties. Um, now, as long as leasehold um, as a tenure is permitted to make money from the leaseholders, there will always be developers who want to sell as leasehold. Um, quite frankly, because why would they want to just, you know, construct a building and pass it over to residents and walk away from that development rather than 
um, you know, retaining the freehold interest and making money through lots of different income streams. Um, you know, it, it's to do with sort of tax and things as well. So that the fact that you've got the competing tenures predominantly leasehold as a way to make money, I think, again, is one of the reasons why common hold hasn't taken off because it is such a lucrative industry. And then the other things is um, price. And as I've just alluded to, pound signs on the leasehold, you know, the price, um, again, estate agents don't really know how to value common hold. Um, and as a result, it's very difficult to sort of sit here and say common hold is a better model than leasehold on valuation reasons alone, um, because the evidence it just isn't there. When you've only got 16 buildings which are common hold, um, you know, you don't have rafts of evidence to prove that that's the case. So I think that's why it hasn't worked here. What I will say at this point is, by analogy, um, the rest of the world, um, bar six countries of which we are one of them, operate on a common hold, not a leasehold system. And it's not called common hold. You know, in Australia, they call it a strata title. Um, there's lots of different names for it. But predominantly, everywhere else in the world operates off a common hold based system. We are in the minority. Scotland, they have a common hold system. Um, so whilst I'm saying all of these things about like why common hold hasn't worked, it isn't the concept of common hold. It's because we started with a different method and a different tenure that has made it really difficult to move from one tenure to another. So it's not common hold that's the problem. And I think that's a really important distinction to make. You know, um, if you speak to people up in Scotland, they will tell you about the common hold system and it operates perfectly adequately and, you know, not without issues, but it still operates. So we know common hold works as a concept. It's just for some reason we haven't been able to make it work because of the competing leasehold interest. So in terms of the reforms, um, it's been identified, obviously, that there are problems with the leasehold system and the government is doing a wholesale review of the leasehold and common hold systems. And on here, you will see um, a link to the government website, the Law Commission, who overhauled, um, sorry, who were tasked with looking at how to overhaul the common hold system. And fundamentally, um, their, their primary aims were to improve common hold and to make it more available and more popular. And the way that they've done that is that they, going back to uh, one of my previous slides, um, they've tackled it by firstly looking at developers. How can we incentivize developers to um, invest in common hold, you know, sell these units as common hold? And secondly, how do we make conversions, um, a more streamlined process to make it work. What can we do to make leaseholders want to convert? So they've divided their report into two different sections. Um, where they are at the moment is that they have created this uh, Common Hold Council, um, which is a uh, formal group um, with very wide ranging interests and um, expertise. And the purpose of the council, and you'll see the link there to the council announcement, is to try and get to the bottom of some of these issues, um, see what we can do to tackle them, and then basically move towards basically reinvigorating common hold. Um, the government hasn't, beyond the announcement of the council, said whether they're going to commit to any of the Law Commission recommendations. We are expecting things to happen in the next year. So within the next year, we will know whether common hold is going to be here for good, whether it's going to be benched in favour of leasehold reforms, um, or whether actually they might take part of it forward. Like they might say, right, you know, we're going to make developers sell as common hold, but we're going to leave alone the conversions. So we don't know what the government are going to do with common hold. What we do know is that the, the interest is there because they've set up this common hold council. Um, and the fact that they've set up the council, um, there's a team working on it at the Ministry of Housing, just shows that the government is taking common hold very, very seriously. For those with existing stock, um, you know, when the announcements uh, first came out, there was quite a lot of concern from leaseholders coming back to this slide about consumer demand, ed education and awareness, who were in a panic because they didn't know what common hold was and they thought that they were going to be forced to move over to common hold. And actually, once you explain to them what common hold is, um, it becomes a much, um, it, it sort of, it 
lease you can see leaseholders saying all oh, right okay that's fine that's a really good idea um but i think predominantly i suspect that the focus will more be on new build supply rather than looking at conversions and existing leasehold stock i could be wrong i don't know what's going to happen um and you know as i say i think in the next 12 months we'll really start seeing some changes on what's going to happen with it so with that and before i hand back um there are just some questions that I just want to throw out to the group. I'm not going to answer these. This is more just like a discussion topic. Um, so there are lots of questions that come out of whether a shift from leasehold to common hold um, is the right thing to do. And I know that many of you here tonight um, have come because it's coming up in conversations a lot more. Um, so some of these questions come up like, is common hold a better ownership model? Um, you know, is it better that the community manage and own these um, sort of communal areas like gardens, parks, so on and so forth. Can it work for other forms of tenure like uh, commercial premises, mixed use buildings, um, you know, live to work units? Will it change the way developers build? So um, by this, I mean, you know, at the moment, developers, they already either keep their investment after they've bought it. Um, so they design, you know, these spectacular buildings because they've got long term interest in it. Um, but if they know they have to hand it over to the residents, will the motivation to build, you know, architecturally pleasant buildings be there? Or will they simply say, well, look, we haven't got that long term investment anymore. So let's just throw up an ugly block of flats because we don't have any long term investment in it. Same with the quality of the building. You know, what motivation has the builder now got to build good quality buildings? If they know that they're not going to retain the long term interest, how do we know that they're going to keep building to really good quality and a high standard? You know, we've already got problems with design defects. You know, we've got um, significant cladding problems in the leasehold system. But if you take away the landlord's opportunity to invest and retain their interest, will that affect the quality of the building what is the end product going to look like is nhbc going to cover these things if the buildings start being built in a substandard way will it work beyond residential so if you've just got a row of shops can you roll out common hold for that instead of having this lease model what about complex sites what if you've got a site where you've got common hold interests leasehold interests um residential, you know, you're all sharing communal spaces like communal gardens, car parks, bin stores, so on and so forth. How is that going to get managed if you've got half of the street being governed by the lease and all this extensive legislation? And then you've got the common hold half who have a lot more flexibility to do what they want. How's that going to work? What does it look like? How does it work with planning? And importantly, is it a one size fits all? Um, you know, I think this is one of the fundamental reasons why leasehold has really struggled because they're applying the same rules and regulations um, to a block of two flats in Brighton to a massive high rise block in London. You know, can you do a one size fits all with common hold? And then lastly, do common uh, consumers want common hold? You know, there's been a real vocal push. Um, and I, I think the answer to that is yes, consumers do want common hold. Um, but, you know, where's the research? Um, in terms of, you know, we go back to the sort of the three different tenure types and leasehold accounts for 19%. How many of those 19% have been asked, would you want common hold? What does that look like? And I've got like, I don't have any strong views on any of these things. I just wanted to sort of throw it out there just for discussion purposes. But these are the sorts of things that I think need answering. And importantly, um, in the context of build quality and build design um, for the purposes, I think, of your session are particularly important. Like, does the long term investment in the building make a difference to those things? So what I've done before I hand over is I've created this fictional street called um, Farm Chesterville just because I wasn't feeling very creative. Um, so this is um, basically a map, if you like. So you've got the street going through the middle. Let's assume for the purposes of discussions that that isn't adopted by the local authority. So all of the local residents have to chip in and maintain that. On the streets, you've then got um, communal bins. Um, you've got lampposts. You've got, um, you know, flower pots that need maintaining and then you've got a mishmash of like the different tenures so you've got freehold houses leasehold houses you've got some commercial units you've got a common hold house and then you've got some larger blocks of flats on the end in different models um, and then you've got some communal spaces so i think 
Um, that's where I'm going to hand back, if that's okay. Um, I'll take this slide off if you like, but I just thought I just wanted to sort of open up discussions by sort of flagging up some of these questions and coming up with my sort of mythical street, as it were. Um, but yeah, I'll hand back if that's okay. Great. Thank you so much. That was really brilliant. Thank you. Um, can I just start with a question in terms of how is it different to uh, community land trusts, for example? Um, community land trusts are a very different um, model um, yeah. because they don't, they basically operate in a different sort of system and there's actually very few community land trusts available um, because of the complexities. Trusts law, for example, is highly complicated. Um, it sort of sits, I would say, halfway between common hold and leasehold because it's still quite regimented. Okay. Um, but you have to have, it's basically, with land trusts, you tend to have more of a say in terms of who joins you. Whereas mm -hmm. with the common hold development, the developer bills and will send it, sell it to whoever wants a unit. And those people that go into it won't have a clue who their neighbours are until after they've joined. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. okay. Um, that's def a fundamental difference because yeah. it will come together with a community land trust. Yes. Um, to to build a collective. Exactly. Housing. Yeah. It's Where more like a, I think it's more like a business because you're it, you know the way you set up a company, you yeah. know who your business partners are in advance and you choose to do that with them. Whereas yeah. with common hold, you're all, all thrown in at the deep end. Um, and you don't necessarily know who you're going into business with, as it were. Okay. I mean, that that could be part of its problem as well, as yeah. well as non-problem. Yeah. Because I think that, in a way, probably will need designing um, in terms of who are the facilitators of those relationships. Because yes. I think yeah. you will need someone to have that facilitator role. But... Um, but that's kind of very, very interesting. Um, so I, I have one um, question coming in uh, from Harry. Um, so really useful. Um, uh, thank you for the great talk. Surely developers would build better because the common holders will appoint the professional managing agent at the moment developers often employ a stooge managing agent to cover up hide effects from the uh, flat purchases, leaseholders, uh, flat, sorry, flat purchases stroke leaseholders and time out uh, the warranties or flog the freehold to some uh, faceless investor so as to wash their hands off it. Uh, in the common hold world, developers would have nowhere to hide. They would also have to build quality to charge more and to reflect the fact that they can't make money from the freehold rever uh, reversions and ground rent insurance commission service charge markups etc. It's a really good question I think the best analogy I can give um, is actually I better not say that because it's being recorded um, but if you think about how things were made um, like years ago they were made to last. Mm. So if you look, so it, I don't know if anybody knows Brighton, but if you go, as you go through Brighton, there's a road there called Preston Road. Yeah. Um, and it's the main road down to the seafront. And if you look to the left and your right, as you drive down, pretty much as soon as you come off the motorway, there are loads and loads of purpose-built blocks of flats. And those flats were mainly built in the 60s and 70s. And um, very, uh, you know, they all have their problems, but not on the scale of the problems we see in new builds that have been be built in the last 10 years. They were made to last. Mm -hmm. And I think... I, wor I guess I, it, I mean, I don't really have a strong view on it, but I guess like it's not inconceivable that you could design and build a building that was okay for the first 10 years and then in the 11th year started degrading. Mm. Um, you know, you can buy, it's to do with the, the quality of materials, isn't it? Like if you take like an iron, a, a steel beam, for example, there's different mm. gradings of steel beam and you could pick materials that are cheaper. Mm knowing that they don't have as much life in them. I mean, obviously, the, there's reputation at stake. Developers are not going to deliberately build these things 
badly knowing that they're not going to last because they're, they're going to want to keep selling after the first 10 years. But it's not inconceivable that the quality may drop as a result. Um, I also think that, um, you know, fundamental to this will be the NHVC because ultimately they're controlling um, yeah. you know, build quality. Mm. And what, what do you think could be incentives? Has there been any thinking around that? Is this incentives for developers to build? Yeah. Um, I don't know is the honest answer. I mean, yeah. I think the biggest incentive for a developer is going to be reputation. And yeah. I, you know, I stress, I don't think developers would intentionally build defective buildings. No. Um, but do you think, do you think local authorities could lead the way? I mean, if this is something the government wants to do, could they not say a percentage of your housing for us to to pilot this and see how it works yeah a percentage of them should be common hall i mean the, i i always think that the kind of quite rigorous design of these things are really important because if it if they're not designed properly as a system yeah. and sure. they fail then they kind of go oh well it failed but actually it just hadn't been designed properly like t uh, tenants and residents associations sure. you know which 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 became a problem because they weren't really trained. I think education is probably the, the, the best way of, you know, that people had to train to get into that position um, to be able to run these kind of, because uh, it, it, it takes, it, it, you know, it does take skills to negotiate, facilitate. Um, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I'm sure that the government will be working and you know that's part of the purpose of the common whole council is to sort of think about these sort of things you know what are the hurdles what's it going to take yeah in order to get it reinvigorated my my personal view I think is that unless the government mandates it there's still so much money to be made in leasehold yeah I worry that unless it's mandated yeah I mean uh, there is a there is a comment from Carolina who's saying maybe 100% yeah. is quite ambitious uh, yes. for 100% to agree and maybe uh, that has yeah. to change and maybe it's about a quorum, you know, the okay. quorum, uh, sorry, that, that you have. Um, that, uh, then, that's actually one of the Law Commission's proposals is that they are looking at reducing that from 100% down to 50%. Yeah, obviously that's one of the, it's just for the government to decide whether or not they want to choose that option to reduce the threshold. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think Katie also says education is so important for this because it's a complete yeah. culture I shift. And I think that that is the biggest challenge. And that's why I was saying when we were talking on the phone, Marie, that could yeah. it happen with just smaller spaces, you know, that you sure. can have common hold lease of, you know the the municipal lawns in your you know in your block or or the communal spaces or you know things like that so that it slowly it's not such a big danger that it's your home you know it's it's kind of slowly building up that yeah. uh, culture um i don't know whether i, should, I ha there's a hand up maybe i do oh it's mostly mostly you have your hand up and then i'll go back to the chat so it's not just me talking yeah hi yeah thank, thanks marie um Great uh, overview. I was just, cause I, I just joined because I was interested in, in, in um, self-build as well. And one oh. of the things about self-build, because uh, in terms of doing it together, I heard, was around mortgages and because there's, um, because of the way in which it's constructed, they won't allow mortgages around a common hold. Or would the common hold get around that problem? That's what I've just done. Um... It, it almost certainly will. Um, it's, uh, if, if you go to the UK Finance Handbook, which is available online, um, you can basically click on any of the registered mortgage providers, which is pretty much all of them. And one of the questions is, do you lend on common hold? Um, and you can very quickly then see which mortgage lenders lend on common hold and which don't. Sadly, um, it's not everyone. <laughs> um, and the terms of what you can borrow on common hold are different to the terms you can borrow on leasehold. Um, but again, you know, that's the purpose of the council is to sort of have a look at these issues. Um, product availability, I think, is one of the biggest problems. It's not just, you know, I alluded to the fact that it's the estate agent, um, but it's everything. You know, residential conveyancing solicitors don't know how to sell or buy common hold units. Um, insurance, buildings insurance for the building, mm -hmm. you 
go to comparethemarket.com, where's the option that allows you to select come and hold, for example, um, you know, right move, where on there does it say come and hold, lease or freehold? Um, so it, it's across the board, I think, the product availability is limited. Managing agents, I must say, are getting much better of it. So they've been aware of these reforms the last couple of years. And the last man couple of managing agent conferences I've been to, they're slowly waking up to come and hold. And I think they will get there probably before other people in the sector. But it's really interesting to sort of see, um, you know, how much of an impact it can make. And, you know, Katie, I think, commented about education is critical. And I strongly mm. agree with that. Mm. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Great. What was the name, sorry, of that place? Yeah. The book you mentioned, sorry? Uh, the UK Finance Handbook. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Harry says, do you think, uh, take from that managing agents uh, discussion, do you think statutory regulation of managing agents will help Common Hold uh, be a success? We're still waiting for our 2019-20 accounts. Uh, these people can set up a company tomorrow, handle millions of pounds of consumer money the next day. Sure. Um, Harry, it's a very good question. I do think it will make a big difference. So I think a lot of the abuses that we see in the leasehold system aren't to do with badly drafted leases. It's the way that those leases are executed, whether that's by the landlord or the managing agent. And, you know, the, the ground rent ban was slightly different. Uh, sorry, the ground rent scandal was slightly different because the ground rent was embedded in the lease. But, you know, we haven't talked about things like onerous permission fees, admin fees, you know, consent fees to do things. Um, lease Leasehold really is that bit more restrictive. And I think Managing agents, um, you know, we've, we've got some really strong self-regulators at the moment, RICS, ARMA, IRPM, etc. And they, they regulate people, but unfortunately, they only regulate the people that sign up to their membership to begin with. So it's not mandatory. And generally, I've found that people that are um, subscribed to ARMA, RICS, etc. Um, are the ones who perform well and you don't really have the same problems as those who aren't registered. So having a push towards regulating managing agents will help but I hasten to add I don't think that's enough I think like private landlords who don't have managing agent unless it's like an RMC right to manage situation um you know something needs to be addressed there as well because there are still quite a lot of landlords who manage in-house not to dominate the conversation very quickly though yeah. isn't it goes back to common hold again because it's who who appoints that managing agent yeah. so one one is an offshore guy He's more interested in income. Yeah. We're more interested in our home and capital value. Yeah. So for him, and I'm not going to name names, but it seems like sweating the asset, pocket the fees, don't maintain the building. And actually he can bring the service charge as high as he likes. Yeah. And he's making a calculation, and it's a correct one, that we've not got the time, money or, or mental health stamina to go into tribunal every year to fight him and do the lawfare. And actually, with common hold, we would appoint the managing agent. If we weren't yeah. happy with them, in a way, you wouldn't even need statutory yeah. regulation. I could get rid of them. At the moment, yeah. I've got a managing agent who's a member of all of those bodies. But my mum's service charge has gone up 61% in six years, which I just think you wouldn't probably have in common hold, would you? No. It, it's to do with autonomy, fundamentally, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's about the decision-making powers. Um, you know, I think it's quite a good time just to flag up that, you know, we, you know, you speak to people over in Australia and Scotland who own... Um, properties in a common hold model it's not perfect um, and you know if you enter strata disputes Australia for example they have all the same problems you know the roof leaks and the common hold association don't want to fix it because they've got priorities elsewhere so the person living on the top floor still has a problem so mm -hmm. I don't think it's a perfect option but it all comes back to education if you can help people understand what their responsibilities and roles are it's not a choice whether you fix a leaking roof you've got to fix it. It's unacceptable to have a leaking roof. Mm. Um, so whatever the model is, I think how the building is managed is fundamental, definitely, in, in either tenure. I mean, can I say something? Sorry, yeah, sure, uh, uh, absolutely. Sorry, I, I own a, a strata in Australia um, and I run it from the UK with four other directors over there. Quite everything's fine, we get on really well. Um, it's all about uh, just managing the building, it's just fixing the roof, as you said, yeah. it, it's not difficult. <laughs> You've yeah. got common rules, uh, just like the common uh, community statement. 
Um, um, the owners are the best people to run the mid building. They know the building inside out. They know their flats. You've got people coming in from outside that just are not interested. They don't know the building well enough to actually uh, repair it. Uh, and it takes so long for things to be done. And in that time, yeah. the building's um, deteriorating and it yeah. costs us even more as leaseholders. It's, uh, it's, it's doesn't work, leasehold. In yeah. that respect, I mean, it's, it's all about maintaining the building. And in Australia, you, you have to have a 10 year maintenance plan. Yeah. It's compulsory. Um, so everyone knows what uh, a builder or a surveyor can put it together. They all know what's coming up, um, how much it will cost to fix and how much they need to save for the reserve fund every year. Yeah. So it's all transparent. Um, we don't need a freeholder to do this. Yeah. <laughs> So is this a good time then to ask anybody for views on whether it is a one size fits all? So that works very well mm. it, where you've got sort of smaller units. But what happens where like Harry's situation, you've got like 200 plus flats. See, and that's where I'd really, yeah, this is where I'd strongly, yeah. <laughs> for me, I would, I would love common hold because you know what? There'd be no conflation potentially of commercial spending with residential. So in our block, we've got mixed use. It's beautiful building, you know, on the outside looks all tickety-boo. But the reality is we've got hotel and service apartments underneath. We've also got flats above. Now, we've seen in our service charges, we're paying for things like the degreasing of hotel ovens. Now, that's because you've got the freeholder who has a conflict of interest because he also owns the commercial. And I know from my own work at Least on Knowledge Partnership, this is not a one-off block. This is happening all the time by the sounds of it in mixed use, complicated bits of machinery and we owned a common hold in Singapore and it, they've got it very clear where the residential cannot put anything on the commercial tab, vice versa, the commercial can't put anything on the resi. So it's completely ring fenced and you wouldn't have this situation which is what we've got in this book and others where there's clearly some conversion. We've been paying for the removal of their wardrobes, all the rest of it, which is not right, really mm. it isn't. And common hold would split that up. Well, I think it would also allow you to have a discussion what, what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And, and I think just, just very quickly before I go to Mothia, and please, anybody who wants to just uh, make a comment or question, just, just do it um, not in the comments because um, we're a small group, so I think we can just do it here. Um, but just one thing, we were talking about commons yesterday and in other sessions when they're large you then make them into smaller units it's almost like if it's a street so you would take one floor for example and they would have their own and then there is something like a community development trust or something that sits and all these smaller ones come under one it's how Siena was run in the middle ages you know where everybody there was participatory governance and so so I think you can do that like that that you have them smaller and then, and then you have an overarching one that you know comes. It's like wards and a and a local authority. I mean, you you do that anyway. So so it is just about the scaling, um, and and I think it's more about dialogue, no, because it hasn't been dis discussed what should be paid, what should not be paid. It's what Carolina is talking about that you know it's discussed. They kind of see what funds they have, what funds they have to raise. And, and so on and, and it's not about like a middle person which m may be needed to kind of uh, for the dialogues to be facilitated but not for a middle person to do the management as such but that's what you've got a uh, managing agent for they they will be there at your AGM and they will be the chairperson yeah oh, okay. to facilitate it okay and they will write the minutes up and um, make sure the voting is right so you have a consensus and a quorum. So. Great, amazing. Mothio, is it a new hand or an old oh, hand? Yeah, new, uh, sorry, I can't get my video to work. But um, yeah, no, that was just, because I, I guess even when I think about it, you know, you've got the reversionary interest and the whole sell and transaction of that, that's what our whole economy is based upon. Like it's a rentier economy, that's where the power, and that's where the influence is. It's not on households. So, 
how you shift that that's why i'm just like, like maybe that's why you know I, I don't know if that was that was part of the sort of number of all the different kinds of reasons why it hasn't taken off but if our whole economy is based upon a rentier capitalism how are you go and that's you know how are you going to shift that just through a, a legal mechanism yeah that's the question, I guess. Yeah. Is, is it possible I mean, to think, shift that through just a legal I, mechanism? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I, Marcia, you know also about the, the Labour's report, Land for the Many, no? Um, yeah. And I wonder if it's interesting uh, to bring that up in relation to this, you know, whether they kind of almost go hand in hand a little bit in terms of the land reform, which, you know, I know is very difficult in this country. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, maybe as a, as a hypothetical question, that might be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think basically the government's in a position where if it, it, it definitely has the power to say, common hold is the future, it's just politically whether they're going to do that because ultimately, they've got, you know, it's conflicting, uh, sorry, competing interests, isn't it? So they've got to get houses built in order to meet supply. But they want to do it to make sure that the end consumer actually gets good value for money, gets good property to live in, so on and so forth. So it's a really fine balance. Mm. Um, where the, the reversionary interest at the moment, that's only on the existing housing stock. So that's where I think the Law Commission have been really good at splitting off the two different aspects, so conversion versus new build. Um, so the reversionary interest concern, I think, would only really be on the existing housing stock rather than new build. And mm -hmm. then it's just whether the government's brave enough to then say everybody on lease hold has to switch over to common hold, because that's where you would then lose that reversionary interest. Mm -hmm. What that looks like, you know, they'd have it might even have to be compensation payable for the loss of the reversionary interest, etc. So. It's a really, it's like conversions, I think, is a particularly difficult one to crack. Mm. I mean, it, uh, unless you also have, I mean, Mothia is also saying that, you know, houses are being built to be land banked um, yeah. in the UK, especially in London. Um, so, again, it's what he was saying, um, that since the whole economy is so based on on land extraction. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, then, then you know, those people are not there to be common holders. Um, and I suppose, yeah, they don't have that investment. So if you have blocks which are common hold, I mean, I think the interesting thing with this is that it's not that you have to, like Tim was saying, you don't have to go and find a bit of land like community land trust or self-build and um and build it so it, it can be developers say okay but this is maybe part of our section 106 <laughs> or something um that we we kind of offer this common hold mm -hmm. because affordable housing quite frankly is not affordable they might as well do this um so so it might be that that is another way to to look at it um that that, that becomes part of their so section 106 offering as an incentive, maybe. I don't know. Um, Harry, you have, you have your hand up. Oh, lovely. And one last comment. Just what happens for those of us that are in the existing stock? Because right to manage common hold conversion, buying the freehold, the Law Commission have put out brilliant recommendations on that. We're still waiting for the government to respond. Two years ago, Lord Bess, the independent crossbench peer, said we need to regulate managing agents. We need to look at sinking funds, look at, look at all the rest of it. I'm obviously conscious that the Law Commission are saying that they're doing 14th programme of, uh, of, of, of reform. There's not a single mention of Section 20 major works, which causes a lot of wealth erosion and misery, things like buildings insurance. So we think, in, you know, uh, brokers and landlords are making up to 60% secret commissions. We've got real no rights of disclosure over that one. All of these other issues that are, you know, if we are going to be stuck with leasehold, at least for those of us in the existing stock, we need to try and have reforms on that because... They're all old statutes going back to the 1980s, you know, when the freeholder was a guy down the street who you could have a chat and a coffee with, not some guy in Monaco who I'll never meet in my life. How would you, how would, you know, is there any appetite you feel for the other stuff, which is more tricky that, you know, the Law Commission could do or someone else could do? 
a really interesting question because I think, um, you know, like you correctly identify, um, you know, that there is a danger, I think, of creating a two-tier market where you've got, you know, I, I highlighted that less than 1% of uh, tenure in England at the moment is common hold. Let's imagine a world where it gets mandated or developers suddenly decide, okay, we've had enough leasehold, we're just going to build everything as common hold. In like 30 years time, and that's why I called my street 2050 street, because it's perfectly feasible that that could shift to so that you then see like 50% common hold and 50% leasehold with the balance being freehold. So it's perfectly possible that over time the market will shift in favour of common hold. And at that point, I think the leasehold old stock at that point would be at risk because, you know, unless the systems are pretty similar and run in tandem, you're at danger of creating a market where common holders can basically do what they like, when they like, at whatever cost they want. And, you know, um, as has been mentioned already this evening, you know, you can carry out works really quickly, by, like Caroline has explained. Whereas under leasehold, you're still having to serve major works notices, you know, you've got to worry about whether there's money getting big bills, etc. So I think there is a danger. Whether that danger is apparent now, I don't know. Uh, because until Common Hall becomes a real threat to it, you know, I think everybody's in the same boat at the moment. Um, but you're right, you know, the current leasehold system is not perfect, but that's why, you know, the reviews that are ongoing aren't just limited to Common Hall improvements. You know, it's a wholesale review. Because I'm worried that right to manage is going to be torpedoed, torpedoed again, that even though theoretically we might have this 50% rule, where if you've got non-residential premises of 50%, and if you're all the residents are leaseholders in the numerical majority, so that's going to be hundreds of thousands of leaseholders potentially enfranchised, some clever lawyer might then try and find a loophole and blow it up at tribunal or something like that. In terms of day-to-day, -day, is there anything that you think could be coming along this track which will allow leaseholders to get control of their buildings and service charges without going through the rigmarole of right to manage or whatever. Is there something on section 20 they're looking at or anything else? Because I if don't you know. Is don't know yet. I, yeah, I can't really answer that. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes, of course, yeah. Um, with, with the existing freeholder, um, how do you think they will be compensated? So they will just go away. <laughs> how do we actually get hold of these buildings? And um, we have to enfranchise first. Yeah. Um, you don't. You don't think that will change, and then convert. And how long will it take? It's not at the moment. It takes like two years. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It's just too long, it, and people will not commit to that. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's that's why the law commission has proposed changing it so that you've got a more streamlined system and relaxing rules like the 50 percent um there's a very helpful if you go to the law commission's website they've got a very helpful summary of the proposals for common hold reform um, and as i say they've done a marvelous job of splitting it down between conversions and new builds yeah um so if yeah, it, value is abolished what is going to be ground rents paid to the freeholder, um, the reversion value for the rest of the term of the um, lease, are they really going to be happy with that <laughs> um, and hand over the freeholds? Um, um, how, how do you think government will um, make this all happen? Um, um. I mean, I, the, the answer is I don't know, because it's like <laughs> until the government makes decisions on things, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. Sorry, uh, I know you haven't got a crystal ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, we've already started to see a couple of developers who, even though the ground rent ban hasn't come in yet, yeah. have already started saying, right, going forward, we're going to personally commit to doing 999-year leases with peppercorn grant rent, and we're going to let residents take over management once the last unit sells. And I know that there are lots of problems with that in practice, but there's already been, you know, even without any legislation signed off yet, the mental shift of developers, I feel, has already changed. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't be thinking about sort of 999 leases and um, mandatory man codes and all the rest of it. I appreciate there's difficulties with it, but yeah. at least they're offering it. That's um, 
step. That's a step. Um, yeah. But the, the ultimate goal is freehold, uh, commonhold, freehold. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes back to what Harry was saying. I think you know, there's probably going to be quite a lot for new builds, mm -hmm. but where that then leaves existing leaseholds, I don't know. To be honest, I, I don't think you will. Yeah, I don't think you will ever have it that it'll be either or. I think you will have it where all of these forms will will have to coexist. And I, yeah. you know, we have a liberal democracy. They're never going to force it autocratically yeah. onto anyone. So, so mm -hmm. I think that's. Um, but I think what Mothier was saying um, that that maybe compulsory purchase orders. Again, I think that's really interesting. Um, it's really interesting, especially with absentee landlords or landlords that that are, you know, I mean, France did it, no? They had a law that if you were not in the country for so many, so many days as a freeholder, you would, whatever, had to pay tax, which was astronomical. Um, so I think, um, but I think somehow, but there are also so many landlords that just nobody knows who they are. Um, and I think on those where you, you kind of have no record of them, I mean, you could say, come and register. I know that land registration is a massive hot potato, but, but in a way, I, you know, if, if, if we don't know, you know, if buildings are falling apart, land is falling apart and we don't know who you are, then we can test it through the common hold uh, as, as developments because you know how many percentage do you need to pilot this I suppose because you need a number to be able to yeah. see whether they're working or not and you can't do it by just policies and thinking you have to actually <laughs> test them so I mean I know we have um, how many you said 300 um, and that's a great number um, is it enough I don't know um, but, um, but I mean, that would be really interesting research to see how they are working those, but that's probably what's been done, Marie, um, interviewing those and that for the, for the reform, right? Um, I don't know how many the Law Commission spoke to. It's probably in their report somewhere, um, yeah. who exactly they spoke to. I know that they did speak, um, cause it's in the back of their report, yeah. um, to various other jurisdictions like Australia, New Zealand, uh, America, so on and so forth, where uh, tried and tested. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we are in the minority with leaseholds, but yeah. unfortunately, because it's been around for so long, it's yeah. sort of stuck and it's whether we can unstick it. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we're at six o'clock. If there are any pressing questions that um, that I haven't picked up from the chat because there, there was at 1.12 <laughs> so came up and I, and I lost lost it. So if there's anything that anybody wants to um, say, then please let's do it now, not in the um, chat. Yeah. May I ask something? Absolutely. Um, with the premise that, you know, I'm a really big fan because also not just because I come from a country where leasehold doesn't exist, and so it was quite baffling to find it. Um, what I wanted to ask is what provision would there be to make sure that the various leaseholders actually contribute? I say this because I used to own a flat where we got the right to manage, a small block, six flats, but uh, the, the main person who insisted we did that turned out that afterwards, yes, we had no service charge, but we also had no repairs because this person refused to address anything that needed done. So what, what provisions would there be for that? Well, I think it, across both leasehold and common hold, I'm a huge believer that um, how disputes are dealt with needs to be reviewed. Um, I, you know, they, we've got a tribunal system and a court system, and both cost a lot of money for uh, leaseholders at the moment and common holders. And I think in that situation where you've got a dispute, of course you're going to get disputes, of course you're going to get two people who don't agree on what needs doing in a building, but the, the reaction to that situation should not be, let's go to the tribunal and fight it out and spend thousands of pounds. That is totally disproportionate and it's not, it doesn't get you anywhere. So I think the key to both the leasehold and the common hold reforms is really going to be to have a look at how disputes get dealt with so that they stop costing lots of leaseholders money 
and common mm. holders. Yeah. Um, yeah. In most cases, it will be things like mediation. Um, it will be things like early neutral um, evaluation and, and that sort of thing. Uh, can I just suggest one thing? Because it's, you know, it's those interdisciplinary things that maybe yeah. are not um, being aligned uh, sometimes. But um, I don't know if uh, any of you know Eleanor Ostrom's uh, Governing the Commons. Um, and she basically talked about eight principles of governing the commons, which uh, was to avoid going to court. And, um, and I mean, she won no Nobel Prize um, for this and it's uh, you can you can find it online but I think that um, that kind of that element of how we might govern them um, without the the kind of statutory or really formalized structures but much more community-based structures is really really interesting and I just wanted to put it out there uh, because I think um, it might be again that cross-disciplinary thinking might be really useful. One other quick point, if I may, and it's good to go back to the history of leaseholds. So Louis Burns, unfortunately, isn't with us today, but a very good point he used to make is that you had a right wing prime minister in Margaret Thatcher, but not to get into politics, but allowed for the compulsory purchase order of freehold land by leaseholders, as long as they could prove that the landlord had done something wrong. Then that was moved into a no fault right under Sir George Young, who's still alive, by John Major. But the whole idea of enfranchisement, which I don't think any other jurisdiction in the world allows, where you're basically having a private citizen compel another private citizen to sell the land to them and have no choice, that was only designed as a temporary thing before we moved into a common whole world. The, the, the idea of John Major at the time was that we weren't going to have the two systems coexisting and we're all going to move to common hold and everything was going to be converted. Then unfortunately, the ruling party got stuck with uh, Europe, Tory wars, so it got delayed and then common hold had to be brought in by new labor so actually if they had the political will they could tomorrow pass a law of parliament and say we're converting all existing leaseholds to common hold but you know the law commission have done amazing work but they're saying that you've got to worry about people's human rights great thank you so much thank you marie thank you everyone for your incredible contributions if you want to be on our Commons um, uh, public talk mailing list to get all of these talks, they're interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary around the Commons, then um, please just uh, send me an email um, on t.khon. <laughs> S-A-R-I at londonmet.ac.uk um, and Hannah just put the links so you can contact us. Um, there's a, that's the next one, infrastructures and social participation um, and the commons. Um, and so, um, yeah, just, just drop me a line or through the website, uh, contact us and I'll put you on. We, we only mainly it's about things that are happening within the public program and the talks um, and, and some things which are happening through the courses. But apart from that, you don't get anything else from us. Again, thank you so much. It's been really fascinating. Um, and um, let's um, keep talking and keep pushing these things. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.